what I'm going to do is is do the Van Gogh cypresses today. Um, the show is opening on May 22nd, so I wanted to get this in before the show opens. Um, so, Vincent Van Gogh's cypresses is the first exhibition to focus on the trees among the most famous in the history of art, immortalized in the signature images by Vincent Van Gogh. Such iconic pictures as the wheat fields with cypresses and the starry night take their place as the centerpiece of the presentation that affords an unprecedented perspective on a motif virtually synonymous with the Dutch artist's fiercely original power of expression. So the, I, I won't read the whole thing. Basically, what it comes down to is, is there are 40 works in the show. So it's a relatively contained and focused show. Um, there are letters and drawings along with the paintings. Uh, and and, and the, the letters actually are illustrated letters too. Um, so let's see. What I want to say to you is Vincent, um, there's a lot of mythology around Vincent. So, I mean, um, I think there's been about eight films about his life from Lust for Life on to last year. Um, I believe Julian Schnabel put out a movie about Van Gogh. It may have been two years ago. I'm not sure when it, when it was actually um, put out. I haven't seen that. But there's there's so much mythology around Vincent's the kind of tragic starving artist routine. Um, he was a very sophisticated and cultured person, um, inquisitive, and really fairly well educated. Um, actually, there, there, one of the lectures, one of the lectures that I listened to was, was um, working with uh, Van Gogh's letters. And and said, um, I'll paraphrase. He said something like, "It would be it would be just a wonderful thing to have a Van Gogh on the wall, and uh, a very different experience having Vincent in the room. Not so much, <laughs> not so much wonderful." <laughs> um, he was a you know a troubled guy um with 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 um a lot of psychological issues that that uh we're all fairly familiar with so i'm going to move on to the most important part about him which was he was a genius and the work is brilliant um His his relationship with his family is. I'm going to move to the next slide. Let's see. His relationship with his family was very important to him. Um, even though at times it was very troubled, um, he had, uh, you know, five other brothers and sisters, um, and he was. A prodigious letter writer, so he would he would write a lot of letters to his sisters, and of course his relationship with Theo was essential to his financial and emotional um, stability. 
um, his immediate and extended family were um, involved in, in um, actually there were a bunch of art dealers and uh, clergymen, basically. Uh, so it's a very interesting mix. He grew up around a lot of art. Um, so Vincent actually um, started out as an art dealer and, and um, became, you know, and did, did okay. Um, he um, became disenchanted with the, with the, uh, um, the art business when he was reassigned from the gallery that he was working in to London um, and decided that he didn't, didn't want to stick with it. So he, um, he moved into um, actually the, the religious pursuit and, and um, so, you know, <laughs> Vincent had an evangelical streak about his art and, and, you know, about religion. And basically the religion thing didn't last long. He was, he was actually working in, in uh, um, a very um, poor area and, and uh, the folks just didn't know what to make of him. Um, so it wasn't long before he kind of lost that position. He had been drawing from when he was a boy. Um, and he did um, go to the academy and studied there. And he also studied with, the, there was another uh, uh, painter who was related to the family. And he studied with, with um, uh, I can't remember what the guy's name was now. Um, uh, Mauv, I think was his name. Um, and so he actually learned the fundamentals of painting. Um, and he began to paint really in earnest in 1881 when he was 28 years old and he died in 1890. So it was less than a 10 year period that in which he created 2,100 works of art, 860 paintings uh, that we know of anyway, uh, that are kind of legitimate that we, that we know for sure were his. And he started out with, uh, with painting, painting the, these very dark peasant stock paintings um, and uh, still lives, learning his craft and, and working, working on these pieces. Um, that's a relatively large piece for him, 32 by 45, the potato eaters. Um, and he was encouraged by by his brother, by Theo, to move to Paris. And um, basically there he was introduced to the avant-garde. And at that time, the avant-garde was the Impressionists and, uh, and the Pointillists. So he very quickly, you can see this, the Potato Eaters was painted in 1885. In 1887, He's, he's doing these light-filled, much uh, more um, coloristic uh, pieces in Paris. Um, not exactly, you know, he was there for, for a, a couple of years and, and um, then really wanted to move out into the country. So um, 
by um, 1888, he was, he was um, staying out in the country. He had rented, rented a space with the support of Theo. He was able to, you know, get by and, and um, paint his paintings. Now, Starry Night, this is the first exploration of this theme, which comes up a number of times in a number of different forms. Um, it's really the precursor of the, the version that we all know and, and love from the Museum of Modern Art. Um, but the focus of this particular show is going to be on the poplars. And here you see um, actually one of the beginnings of, of his use of the poplars. And, and they stand in that background and kind of hold this, this amazing, turbulent, uh, color-filled garden onto the, onto the canvas and keep it from spilling off into the sky. Um, the brushwork in this, the, the um, fluidity and, and, and kind of rapid um, uh, pace, the layering of color, the, um, this, is, this is not a, a very thick painting. You know, a lot of areas go right down to the canvas. You can see it showing through in the sky and, and in various places throughout the, the, uh, the garden, it goes could we right see it, Larry? the canvas. What? Could you enlarge it so we could see the layering? Or... Um, sure. Or not. Well, yeah, no, here we go. So you can see here where um, there's basically these brush marks, thicker paint, and, and you can see the, the, the beige areas, that's actually the ground of the canvas. The canvas is showing through. So there's, there's very thick paint in layers on top of that, but, but he's allowing the canvas to show through and act as a unifying ground for the, for the surface. Even back in here where you see these colors that look similar to the ground color, they, they, are, they are just there. Now, what he would do with these things is, is he would do reed pen drawings. And we'll, we'll look at some more of those. The directionality of the brushwork that you see in this is kind of indicated in those drawings. It's kind of those, those drawings gave him the the idea of using these percussive brush marks to, to move the eye around the canvas. So, so basically what, what Van Gogh would do and this is very common among the Impressionists, is he would work on a theme. He would work on, in an area. And at this, at this point, he was painting very rapidly. He would paint sometimes two or three paintings in a day. Um, very intense, very focused. Um, if, if you notice, the, the painting on the left, it's very bright and very intense and very light. There are no shadows cast. You know, everything is illuminated. There's no shadows underneath the trees. There's no shadows anywhere in this painting. There, there are color, color changes which move your eye around. There are these radical distortions of, of perspective that he uses. Um, in, in, in this other painting on the right, you do see 
some shadows underneath the trees. So it's a slightly different time of day and all that, but he uses the shadows to keep the eye from going just straight off the canvas, out the back, and you're done. Those, those little shadows that are underneath those, the, the, those orchard trees kind of stop the eye from just zooming out of the thing. And what he does on the painting on the left is he extends out this fence. So that kind of keeps the layer from, from there's a turn that's happening with the, with the perspective going behind that fence, but the fence keeps you from following that right off the canvas again. Um, now, again, we've got the poplars in the back. I mean, the, excuse me, sorry. The cypresses, these, these are, he was fascinated with these trees. I don't think they had them in, in Holland and, and they were, they, there were a lot of them in the countryside in, in France. So he was absolutely fascinated by them and the kind of twisting columns. Ah, okay. And then there's the olive groves. So the, the olive, the olive groves are something which he was another theme that he played up and worked with. Um, uh, and the repetition of, 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 the, of the forms, these twisting gnarled shapes, um, are powerfully animated. They kind of burst up out, out of the earth. Um, this kind of slashing linear brushwork, moving the eye around the canvas. Again, um, in, in the one on the, on the um, right, you see these um, flowers. Well, actually, the, one of the things that, that Van Gogh, and I'll talk more about this, one of the things that Van Gogh was interested in was um, complementary colors, okay? Colors that are opposite on the color wheel um, set up a kind of um, brilliance. It, it actually accent, accentuates the color. And so what he's doing with these, with these um, red flower-like shapes and the reds in the tree trunks is, is actually setting off the green. So without, without those, you know, if you look at the other, the other painting that's here, the other olive grove painting, it's beautiful, it's brilliant, it's, it's very powerful, again, twisting and gnarled and, and moving, but it doesn't quite have the dynamics of the, of the reds that are, that are in the, the olive grove painting on the right. Um, now, there is some rusty red that's in the foreground of the right-hand corner of the, the olive grove on the left that may have been more brilliant when Van Gogh painted it. Um, he, he used um, some colors. There's a red that he, that he loved and that red is fairly fugitive. In other words, it fades with time. So a number of the paintings that he painted had pinks and reds in them that have faded out quite a bit. Um, some of them you, you can't even, they turn totally white. Um, and I will, I'll, I'll show you some of those later. So, these are a couple of his palettes, and you can see that even on his palettes, you can see how he's um, working up those the brushwork before he puts the mark on the canvas. He's pulling the 
the the paint off in those stripes and you can see the the harmonies in these palettes that he's working with in his in his his paintings and this box of wool it one of the um lectures from um the boston um museum of fine arts goes into the technical aspects of of van gogh's paintings and and one of the things that they talked about was this box of wool this uh these colored skeins of wool and what he would do is take out threads of the of the the uh wool and put them together in his hand to see how they worked together and you you can almost see in in these things how he was using almost threads of paint throughout the throughout the paintings we'll look more at that but i thought these were wonderful these palettes were <laughs> just terrific i wanted to share those with you okay the effect of daylight the sky Uh, th this is this is actually one from one of his letters. Um, for myself, I look for the contrasting effects in the foliage, which changes with the tone of the sky. At times, when the trees are bare, it's when the tree bears its pale blossoms and the big blue flies and emerald fruit beetles and cicadas in great numbers fly about, everything is immersed in pure blue. Then as bronzer foliage takes on more mature tones, the sky is radiant and streaked with green and orange. And then again, further in autumn, the leaves take on violet tones, something of the color of a ripe fig, and this violet effect manifests itself most fully with the contrast of the large whitening sun within its pale halo of light lemon. Sometimes too, after a shower, I've seen the whole pink and orange, I've seen the sky pink and orange which gives an exquisite value in coloring to the silvery gray greens. And among all this are women also pink <laughs> who were gathering fruit. So we're looking at these paintings now and it's, it's hard to see all the range of colors that he's talking about because a lot of them have faded. Um, again, that pink, that that red that he was using to make the violets and things like that have faded. So we don't know what these paintings actually look like. As magnificent as they are tonally and and compositionally now, they were they were more luminous at the time that he painted them because the reds and the and the 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 violets actually, because he made up his violet mixing this red and blue. Um, one of the other things that he's talking about in here is this notion that he, that he had that different seasons have different colors. Um, he would, um, he would actually designate, uh, like the fall would be a violet and 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 yellow, contrasting colors on the color wheel. Um, uh, you know, summer's red and green. Um, uh, spring, you know. So you get the idea. He had these these color theories that he was working with, and I'll talk more about that also. Um, I don't want to bore you with it, but uh, but it, it's interesting to know the the thought that's behind these paintings, 
they didn't just come out of a, a uh, impulse. He really thought through what he was up to with these things and describes them in depth in, in, in the letters to Theo and, and his sister. Um, and actually there's other painters who he was friends with. Speak of the devil. Um, now, Millet was one of his favorite painters and he actually copied the sower a number of different times. Um, uh, there's a humble quality to, to Millet's paintings that, that Van Gogh really identified with. They're out of the earth, they're, they're humble subjects, farming and, and, and peasant stock about their daily work. Look at that sun. So uh, the, other, the other thing that, that happened was when he was in Arles, he, he had this, this notion that he wanted to create a artist community out in, out in the countryside. And he invited uh, Gauguin to come and stay with him as the beginning of this uh, uh, hope for a, a school of painting in the South. And, and uh, Gauguin came and stayed for two months and they just found each other unbearable. <laughs> didn't, didn't work out so well. But one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about here is, is his uh, Gauguin and, and an, another wonderful painter by the name of Emile Gernard were again, communicating by letter with Van Gogh and and um, um, Gauguin and Bern Emile Bernard were really interested in the idea of imagination, of the, of the, of the spiritual component to painting and, and not being chained to the, um, the visible, the, the observed. Um, Vincent, was a, a, a person who loved to paint out of doors and loved to paint from nature, but he also took those paintings, like most of the Impressionists, we operate under this notion that the Impressionists painted their entire paintings outdoors. They did not. They, they started them, many of them, and reworked them in the studio. Uh, Vincent did the same. And, and although some of his paintings were painted completely outdoors, he would also bring them back to the studio and rework them. And he would also paint from memory in his studio. When he would see something, he would go out and do drawings and things like that and, and work from those in his studio and work up paintings. And I have a few examples of that in, in the presentation that, that I will come to. Um, so Van Gogh, uh, after, after, you know, it's all that famous stuff about the ear, ear lopping and all that, I won't go into too much of that stuff, but he did, did have a, you know, a breakdown and was in, in, uh, in a hospital for a period of time, um, and then got back to work. Um, and this, um, is one of the paintings that is, that is central to the show. Um, the wheat field with cypresses um, was painted after he was allowed out of the, the, um, the hospital that he was staying in and going out into the countryside and starting to paint again. Um, and, the, you know, the rhythmic quality of this, of this piece, this wild sky, um, remarkable. One of the things that he uh, talked about 
about the the cypresses that fascinated him, he he compared them to obelisks. And in in kind of Egyptian and Greek mythology, they are symbols of of eternity, of immortality, of of the ongoing cycle of, of and, and again, the wheat fields is another cycle of life and death, of, of rebirth. Um, so it's, it's this symbol of eternity and change, this, this business of, of constant change in nature, but, but the kind of rooting of, of a certain kind of power and force that is symbolized in, in these, in these things. And this is where that symbolist business comes in, into play. Um, and, uh, th this is actually a section out of the book that's going to accompany this, this exhibition. The book is not quite out yet, but I found, I found some pages out of it and you can see the reed pen drawings and how much um, the 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 marking this this kind of um, uh, swirling um, quality is depicted in in these reed pen drawings and actually you would go out and and pick pull the reeds out of the river and and cut them and and work with them with ink. Um, and again, we're looking at this, this painting and I suspect that there, that in this foreground area where you see this reddish brown business, that it was more intense when he painted it. And I also suspect that there was a violet that was in those trees that has faded out. But that's just my supposition. If I had Photoshop, I'd Put it in there, but <laughs> we won't do that right now. Ah, okay. And this is uh, the hospital at Saint Remy. Um, uh, he was not allowed out into the countryside at that point, but he would go out and paint. Um, and you know, basically, he would he would have these repeated bouts with. Um, I'm not even going to say speculate on on what the diagnosis is of of Van Gogh. He had psychotic episodes. He did did have hallucinogenic periods. Um, I don't know if it's manic depression. I don't know what what you would call it. That's not my job. My job is to look at the paintings and appreciate what they are. And, you know, this painting really embodies a lot of the turbulence of, of, of that period for him. Um, although this is not a, an irrational painting, it is certainly not reasonable. And it, it definitely has a um, emotive quality that, that's, that's really turbulent. And I'm gonna step back again into the notion of Van Gogh as a very well-educated man. Um, he and his brother Theo uh, collected um, Japanese prints. So um, the influence of the cropping and the and the use of distortion and um, a number of different you know big expanses of 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 flat color playing off of um, gradients graded color from light to dark and and all that the stuff that that Van Gogh would have picked up on from these prints. Um, 
they were all just mad. The impressionists were all madly in love with the, the Japanese prints, as you know, we covered in, in um, uh, the earlier talk that I had done on, on the Japanese. Um, but you know, what you see here is this, this path through the willows. Um, you know, the use of, of complementary colors, again, the play of the, of the, of the green against the warm muted, um, rust of the, of the wheat fields. Um, and you can, you can see that in the, in the print, in the Japanese print, the use of red and green playing off of each other throughout, throughout the print. Um, And below you see one of one of Van Gogh's um, reed drawings. Many of the reed drawings were done as a description for Theo. When he was writing a letter to Theo, he would he would include some of these drawings so that he could show him what he had done in the painting. So in actuality, um, uh, they, the, the paintings, the painting that, that you're seeing here didn't have an underdrawing under it. What he would do is he would, he would actually use a yellow okra um, as, as a brush drawing underneath it before he would paint into it. Um, so he, had, he, he did do underdrawings at an earlier phase, but now he uses the paint as the underdrawing. Um, so he would use um, solvent, he would use turpentine mixed in with the paint so it was very light, but he would, he would actually knock in the composition with that first, do the underdrawing that way. Okay, and here you have it. Here's, here's one of the drawings directly in one of the letters to, to Theo. Um, and here we are with the sun and the moon, the stars and the moon, um, uh, the, two, the two figures. Um, I can't read French, so I can't, I can't translate. Ah, okay. This beautiful piece gives us a hint about his process in, in a certain way. Um, you can see here where, you know, that sky is, is, is brushed in and he's allowing the canvas to act as the clouds and who knows if he was intending to come back and and paint into that with clouds, but he 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 just let it be. Um, again, we have our cypresses in the background, kind of holding holding the space, holding the piece on the canvas. Um, the interesting part that I find interesting in this particular canvas is, is these red roofs that are behind the green. The green is in the foreground. Well, red and green are, are warm and cool colors. So warm colors tend to come forward and, and cool colors tend to recede. So what's happening here is he's trapping these red roofs with this green foreground and the green on the roofs. So there's a tension that's happening with the green on the, uh, in the foreground and the red behind it. So there's that, there's that dynamic that's happening in here. 
And then there's these, these just wonderful wavering grooves throughout this whole thing. Uh, quite an interesting piece. And this is the late piece. This is 1890. Now, you know, he died in 1890. So this is really a late piece. The beautiful part is, is being able to see how that brushwork, how he worked up that brushwork and how that came in. Now, you know, in this foreground, um, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull, pull up the zoom and we'll look a little bit at this. You can see how thickly painted this foreground is. There's a lot of what is called impasto, very thick paint layered on there. And, you know, you look at the sky and yeah, there's these thick, heavy brush marks up there, but it goes right down to canvas in between those marks. And even over here in the roof, he allowed that, you know, the, the um, canvas to show through. It all works. This painting was completed in 1889 while Van Gogh was voluntarily in, in incarcerated in the asylum of St. Paul near Saint-Rémy in Provence. Um, Van Gogh created several paintings of the wheat fields with cypresses when he was able to leave the asylum and explore the landscape. This painting manifests the psychological tension that can be found in some of the other uh, pictures during this period. Van Gogh was fond of painting cypresses and wheat fields, and he depicted them many times over the years. They symbolize the cycle of life and death. He found them inspiring and comforting. Van Gogh wrote, wrote his sister that he had just completed a painting depicting a field of yellow wheat surrounded by brambles and green bushes. At the end of the, the field, a pink house with a tall and dark cypress tree that stands out against the distant purplish blue hills against a forget-me-not blue sky streaked with pink whose pure tone contrasts with the already heavy scorched ears, whose tones are as warm as a crust of bread. <laughs> uh, so we can't see the violets that he's talking about or, or, or actually the, the, the warmth of the red that I think was in, incorporated into this foreground. Um, so again, you know, having this letter gives us gives us a clue that these paintings are wonderful, but they aren't what they were when he painted them. And you can see the the drawing up 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 above that um, he probably did for his sister. Um, I'm not sure about that with this one. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't integrated into the letter itself. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to show you some of the close-ups that I pulled up of, of the foliage. So now we're getting into the weeds. Uh, and you can see how the brushwork, the rhythms of the brushwork, you know, what, what he's up to, you know, it's thick and thin. It's not everywhere. You know, you see the spaces where it's, it's bare canvas underneath those, underneath those luscious strokes of paint. Okay. And let's talk about this hallucinogenic gem. Um, I I 
I really see this this painting um, as another step in the development of this idea, this pulsating, luminous response grappling with his place in the universe. Um, the guy, um, you know, had a sense of 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 the unified quality of 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 the earth and the sky and he was trying to portray that um again this earlier starry night piece you know the 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 little rays of 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 starlight is kind of very childlike in the, in that one and in this one they are just so boldly painted um again um how much of this was painted on the spot? How much of it was studio invention? How much did he go back and rework this painting? We don't know that at this point. Um, painting wet into wet with really thick paint and keeping it as clean as he does. How did that happen? Remember the, the, the sky, that blue sky in the, the, the painting that I'd shown you in um, 1890s with the red, the red roofs, he would allow the, the spaces to be there between those strokes and keep it really clean. Um, I've painted a lot. I know what kind of a feat that is. This guy technically really developed this, this approach to painting to keep that from turning into mud, from just dissolve the strokes dissolving into each other. So did he let it dry in between and approach and come back into it? We don't know that for sure. There may be ways of, of researching that and finding out what's going on with it. From my understanding, many of these paintings were still wet a hundred years after being painted. Um, the surfaces were so thick. Ah, and the 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 Hokusai wave would have been something that Van Gogh would have known. Basically, there was a huge show of of um, Japanese prints and Japanese paintings it, um, in Paris with hundreds and hundreds of them. So the great wave would have been one that he was familiar with. And when you look at this and you look at that, uh, it's not too much of a stretch to say it's just a different kind of wave, but it's dealing with the natural forces in a, in a way. Okay, and again, you know, look at this, look at the sky, um, this big stylized shape of sky and, you know, the turbulent land masses, they, they have a very organic undulating quality to them. And, you know, th these trees get up and dance. Uh, you know, there's, there's so much going on in, in, in these paintings. They're so active. Larry? Yes. We have a question. Okay. Um, can you zoom in for details on that, on the one that you just had? The, this, this particular one? Yeah. I think so. That's when it came up. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Zoom in. And you know, the quality of the of the reproduction is not that great, but you can you can really see the thick layers of paint that are that are on there. 
And again, there's still areas where there's, where there's bare canvas showing through. Even with that, that thick, heavy paint. And one of the reasons why that's happening is he's trying to keep the, the, the brush marks really distinct from one another. So they're not, they're not all kind of merging and getting, getting unclear and muddy. He wanted that, that kind of sharpness to be there. Okay. Now, the, the other thing that I wanted to address is this thing called optical mix. Um, and one of the things that the Impressionists were, were into is the notion that if you put down a yellow next to a blue and they're, they're near each other, that, that th there would be a vibration, that there would be a, a mix that happened in your eye when you're looking at that painting from a distance. So you would see that yellow and that blue kind of as become a green. They would put in interim greens in between them and play around with that. Um, again, you know, uh, people like Seurat with the, with the um, pointillist movement took that to an extreme and they, they actually made distinct dots next to each other. Suppose I have to paint an autumn landscape, trees with yellow leaves, very well. If I conceive it as a symphony in yellow, what does it matter whether or not my basic yellow color is the same as that of leaves? It makes little difference. Much, everything comes down to my sense of the infinite variety of tones in the same family. So you can see this, this wheat field with the reaper. And looking at the, the Van Gogh, I've, I've avoided doing a whole lot of these wonderful portraits and amazing self-portraits and the portraits of others in this, in this talk because we're focusing mostly on the cypresses and the, and the landscape aspect of, of Van Gogh's work. But, when you look at this marvelous um, portrait, self-portrait, um, with the swirling background, it's, it's really like those skies that we were just looking at. Um, I'm gonna go back. And you look at the swirling masses in this landscape and in that, in that sky, and you go back to, those backgrounds, you know, the distinct distinction between um, uh, landscape and portrait kind of dissolves a bit. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to go into a little bit more depth on this on this self portrait because it actually illustrates some of the color theory that I've been talking about too. Um, Vincent van Gogh's color theory was based on three laws of color. Oh, I'm going to cover up for a second. Okay, sorry. Um, the law of simultaneous contrast where complementary colors intensify each other like red and green. And if you look at this self-portrait, um, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. If you look at this self-portrait and you look at the red color in his beard playing off of the green in, in the, in the the jacket and the background, um, 
that's the kind of intensifying that he's talking about. And if you look at the color wheel that's down below, you see that the red and the green are opposite on the color wheel. Um, so that's where you know this this kind of notion of 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 opposites and intense those things intensifying themselves. The red beard against those green eyes. Um, tonal contrast achieved by broken tone next to a whole tone, like red and red-ish. Um, so you can see that again in, in this where, where um, there's, uh, hold on again, let's see, zoom in. And if you look at, you know, there's these reddish marks, and then there's these very bright red areas in that beard. And you can assume that that red beard was even redder than it is here um, in, when he painted it. Okay. Ooh, I didn't realize how, how, far, how far along I'm so absorbed in Van Gogh. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to move along because we don't have a whole lot of time. Um, Van Gogh wanted to know more about how colors work. He studied lots of books on color theory. So I'm not going to bore you with more of this. I'll move on because we have a lot of beautiful pieces to see. Again, the cypresses kind of nailing this thing down to the ground. Beautiful painting. And again, the correlation between the Japanese print and, and compositional elements that, that Van Gogh used, the cropping, the, the overlapping of, of, of form, um, <clears throat> complementary colors. Now, there's a tranquility in, in the uh, Hiroshige where this, this piece is, is very much filled with the angst of being in the garden of the asylum. Um, ah. So um, Marguerite Gachet is the daughter of, of Dr. Gachet, who was someone who Van Gogh went to in uh, Over, um, who was an herbalist and had worked with, um, you know, psychological problems using herbal remedies. Uh, Gachet himself suffered from, from psychological issues that he used these herbal remedies for. Um, I'm not gonna say too much about all of this. They're just beautiful paintings. And I don't know if the Mar Marguerite Gachet painting is, is in this show, but again, we have the pop orders in that background, nailing things down and this turbulent, wonderful garden. And it wouldn't hurt us to take a zoom at this too. Look at that paint. <laughs> If we could get up this close in the museum, I'd be happy, but uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't smile on that. Uh, and again, this is, this is a wonderful late painting, wild thing where, where, you know, what's going on with this painting? You know, these blues that are in the shadows in the foreground are lighter than, than the, the earth that they're on. Um, you know, the cast shadows are, are the same color as the, as the mountains in the, in the distance. And you can see a little hint of the violet that's in those mountains. You know, I'm suspecting that there was much more of that in this foreground and that color has faded and becomes this light blue rather than being the violet that it was. But that's my guess. And we'd have to go. We'd have to go to the experts to affirm or deny what I'm saying right now. Okay.
And again, when you look at these blossoms, you can see some pink hinting through. These were probably bright pink blossoms on this almond blossom tree. And now we're coming to the end. It's rather ominous manifestation. Uh, Barry, yes. Somebody asked, is that Vincent walking as one person of the couple walking? That's an interesting idea. You mean, you mean back here? I think so. Um, uh, I would, I would say no, um, but you know, who knows what was going on inside his mind at that time. Uh, and who knows if that painting was even painted outdoors. It was probably painted indoors. Um, okay. And this is two portraits he did. He did, I, I think he did about a half dozen portraits of Dr. Gachet. And, and here is, uh, you know, he's holding the, this herbal flower. And this I know was, was painted from memory, this turbulent landscape, memories of the North. Okay, so there's, there's a wonderful talk on YouTube by Ephraim Rubenstein on the letters of Van Gogh. And it really gives you more of a sense of, of how sensitive and how, um, well, his letters are, are quite remarkable literature. Um, there are six lectures on Van Gogh by John Walsh, brilliant fellow. Um, Walsh was, was the curator, I believe he was the, um, the head of the Getty Museum. And he also worked at several other museums, including the MFA. Um, and wonderful speaker, very funny, uh, but also really knowledgeable. I mean, I just, I, tip my hat if I was wearing one. Um, and all of the, man, the, the uh, Boston MFA talks are worth a listen. So um, that brings us to the end of this talk. Next time, I am actually going to do the Cecily Brown and we are going to list it on, on the website. So you know what's coming. So in two okay. weeks, we're going to do Cecily Brown. She is she has a show on at uh, Metropolitan. That show is on until December. So, oh, one other thing that I want to say. Uh, my wife and I went to see the Bonard show that is at um, Aquavilla Gallery, which is uptown. It's on 79th Street. It is only on through the end of May, and it's Oh, so wonderful. It is not a gigantic show, but the pieces that are in it are primo and worth a visit. I'm telling you, this is, this is just worth going out of your way to see. It's right near the Metropolitan, too. So if you go to the Met, go see the show. You never give us such recommendations. Larry, do you have the address, the name of it? And could you put it on the chat function? The name of the, the gallery? gallery is Aquavella. It's on 79th Street. Aqua, A-Q-U-A? Yes. Aqua Villa. Okay. And, and it's, it's a great show. I mean, if you, if you just Google Bonard in Manhattan right now, uh, the New York Times, I believe, did a review of the show. But so you'll find it. It's, it's, a, it's a great gallery. Okay. All right. Anyone have any questions? Nope. Okay, Larry. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all. We'll see you um, maybe for the 17th and for Larry's program next. Okay. Bye, everyone.